button now. <laughs> um, welcome to the third in our terms um, seminar series on 21st century health. Um, before I make my introductions, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Could you make sure your devices are on silent? Um, and if you're planning to tweet about the seminar, um, the hashtag is C21Health. And if you're watching online, please do send questions through by Twitter, and I'll try and make sure that we pose them to David. Um, and I want to plug some of the forthcoming events before we get started today. Um, on Monday, we have Wolfgang Lutz coming to talk about the intersections between population, education, and global development, and that's a panel discussion. Uh, that's on Monday evening. Next Thursday, the seminar series on health will continue with um, a panel discussion on sustainable diets, so from a health and an environmental perspective. And as I'm sure you all know, our events are all online, so please do have a look at the website and sign up. So that brings me on to introduce today's speaker. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. David Clifton, who's based at the Department of Engineering Science, where he heads up the Computational Health Informatics Group. Um, he is going to talk today about the latest developments in M Health, um, where Oxford is leading on some of the current research. Um, that's a very brief description description, but I'll hand over and let David do the talking. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation to be here as well. It's a great pleasure to talk to you all. I see some familiar faces. A quick, I think, raise of hands, please, if you're from the medical campus. Okay, a minority. That's, that's good. That's good. Usually when I give a talk, there's a lot of hands go up at that stage. Huh? Uh, that's good. So we've got a more, a more multidisciplinary audience. So um, that's going to fit the texture of this talk, where what I aim to do is give you a bird's eye view of the kind of technologies that we're developing um, at Oxford, which is a, a very collaborative environment in itself. We're very fortunate to be embedded on the medical campus, which is why I asked, um, where um, engineers share space with medics, and in fact, even in our group in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, we have medics who are taking three years out and coming from medical, medical science to do doctoral degrees in engineering and medicine at the same time. So this is, I think this is part of the, the, the next generation, which is very much underpinning a lot of the entrepreneurship and a lot of the innovation that we're seeing in this area. And this is an area which is ripe for those things. There's a huge amount to be done. There's a huge amount to get it right, particularly in what we're talking about today, which is mobile health, or M-health, um, if you like buzzwords. Um, but of course, that means, that means somehow using the innovations that, we've, that are now becoming ubiquitous um, in personal computation, ubiquitous computation, everybody's carrying a smartphone, which is extremely powerful. What can we do with these devices to help us improve healthcare and improve the way healthcare is delivered? Now, the rub here is that there is a huge amount, a vast amount, as I'm sure you know, of hot air that is spoken about this particular subject. Um, there are a few related subjects um, which, about which there's a lot of hot air spoken, big data being one of our favorites, um, and also cloud computing. And one of the subtitles of this talk could be uh, big data for mobile health using cloud computing, because that's pretty much what we do. And I, I, it's unfortunate to say so, but I have to add the caveat that we're actually doing some medical research here. This is underpinned by patient studies involved with clinicians. And perhaps, <laughs> this, perhaps uh, this is one of those instances where all those buzzwords are actually underpin, un, underpinned by some real science. And that's what I'd like to give you a feel for today. What is it that we're doing at Oxford to, to put together the science that underpins the next generation of mobile health? Obviously, Anybody can collect data. And that's an increasing problem in all walks of life. We get, my colleagues and I in information engineering get a lot of uh, requests from external industry for saying effectively, we've collected terabytes of data. What can we do with this? Can you help us exploit this vast quantity of data that we've got? Because we'd like to do something meaningful with it. And we've, I'll, I'll give you a, a very brief history of um, some of the kinds of techniques in that area that we've been working on. But no, in, in no, no, no more place is that true than in healthcare. We're, the healthcare system now, particularly in developed nations, um, 
particularly in places where there is socialized medicine and a, a large integrated system, such as in the NHS, we're collecting huge amounts of data about everybody. Some of it's controversial, as you will know, if you live here and you have been asked by the government if we can have all your data, please, um, for people like me to use it for, for good purposes. Uh, that's, that's obviously extremely con uh, controversial. Um, and once one has collected vast quantities of data, and some of this is genomic data, some of this is regular data that accumulates through just being treated by the healthcare system, your GP, your family doctor, or your hospitals, um, and some of it may be coming from an, the next generation of wearable and mobile computing devices, which are increasingly being used in healthcare situations. And we're doing a lot of that here. So perhaps within the next five to 10 years, the way that healthcare is delivered, you'll start to see some changes. And it, it's not an exaggeration to say that Oxford has had a, a key role in introducing some of these technologies into places like the NHS, where, I'll give you some examples, where these are actually being used to improve patients' lives. And the name of the game is not collecting of data, but it's doing something with it. And really, that's, that's what we're here for. So at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, um, where I, I've been uh, for a long time working with Professor Lionel Tarasenko, who's now our head of department, um, and with Martin DeVos, our uh, latest member uh, of the team at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, we're very much interested in that, answering that question. Anyone can collect data, but what can we do to turn that data into something useful? So I don't like this phrase. You would have gathered that by now, big data. I really, really dislike that phrase. Um, and so I put it in sort of standoffish quotes. Um, big data is a phrase that we used to write into grant applications maybe three or four years ago um, to demonstrate that we were at the cutting edge of science. Um, and that's, that's sort of faded away now, the, the phrase big data, which is good. But what it means is, in practice, um, we've got very large quantities of very disparate possibly conflicting information about patients. And you will probably know that we tried to create, for example, a, a UK electronic health record, a one-size-fits-all electronic health record. It was a really ambitious project. It was one of, I think it was Europe's largest ever software engineering project, famously failed, Connecting for Health. Um, and it was, it was trying to impose a large-scale common system on the, on, on the NHS, including the GPs and family doctors, but including hospitals as well. And, and that failed for the obvious reasons that that's extremely difficult and everybody resisted it and technical problems caused it to fall apart. In engineering, there's a maxim, if you take two systems and plug them together, they won't work. So you can imagine if you take every hospital system and try to plug them together, the results are predictable. So a couple of years ago, the, the Chancellor, our, the UK Finance Minister, um, said, it's over, it's over to you guys. Innovate from the ground up, create your own electronic health records, demonstrate that they work, um, and then we'll see how those can grow, evolve in a more natural state. And for those of you who know our healthcare system here, it's quite a feudal healthcare system. Every, every area has its own fife. Every area has its own set of barons, which control... We need a Magna Carta, I think, to... to to, to equalize that landscape, but that's how it works at the moment. So, so in some sense, being able to um, work from the ground up fits the model that we have, um, and it also allows us to capitalize on, on local experience and expertise, such as we have here at Oxford. We're very fortunate to have a very joined up academic and healthcare network. We've got an academic, academic um, health sciences network now, which is sort of a regional network of academics sharing ideas and data and uh, best practice across the region. So, we've got one of these now. We've got an electronic health record. It was turned on in 2012. My second son was entered into it. He's got a Chinese name, so it was really difficult to get it into the electronic health record, but he's in there from birth. Most, most everybody else will be getting it, be ported into it as adults. And we're collecting a lot of data in here from routine care. We're actually getting a lot about uh, people who come through the hospital. And surely we can as I was saying right at the start, surely we can turn this into something useful. Some of the examples of those, and I won't read them all out, are shown up on, on the page. And a lot of them 
going back to the point of today's lecture, are based on mobile data sets. So, for example, lightweight sensors worn by patients as they move around the hospital, sending patients home with smartphone-enabled systems such as, such as these patches, um, and smart pills here are made out of amino acids which your body can digest but still transmit to the phone, and perhaps other systems which you might encounter when you're in the waiting room for your, for your family doctor, for your GP up here. So we're, this, is, this is what is being done now um, in the UK NHS. And of course what we want to get towards is robust systems that can really be used uh, in the wild, so to speak. So this is a very controlled environment. We're doing it deliberately. We're growing these systems within the uh, quite well-controlled confines of the NHS, where we've got expertise, we've got very well-trained nurses. Um, it's, it's quite expensive. We're spending a lot of the government's money doing this, um, but the results, uh, I think, are hopefully quite, quite convincing. And this is, this, what we haven't got on here are, is the other side of the story. These are devices to which um, people who are unwell would be attached. But obviously the flip side of this problem the flip side of this uh, argument is that surely one can use healthcare systems or uh, health monitoring systems to provide wellness rather than tracking someone's sickness. So we've, we've focused a lot on sick pa patient, patients because of the way these uh, systems have evolved. But with new sensors becoming available, wellness applications and the use of this science in wellness is something that we're, we're very uh, keen on. So for example, Apple Watches are about to be released, and they've got some healthcare sensors built into the back of them. They're going to track certain uh, vital signs. And then the question comes down to, well, we're collecting data again, aren't we? What are we going to do with all that data? So that's the, the thesis of this presentation. What are we going to do with all that data? So the background for all this work, um, particularly in the themes that I've presented there, um, came from... Um, our history of working with Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce came up to us um, and said, we've got terabytes of data from our uh, engine programs and we'd like to be able to uh, have some intelligent, predictive algorithms to know when our patients, and here's one, it's a very large patient, and you can, you can stand in it, it's the Airbus A380 engine, the Trent 1000, and we'd like to know when those are going to suffer health problems. We'd like to be able to predict them, and we'd like to, very much for them not to explode, we'd like to be able to uh, avoid uh, these problems in advance. And these are exactly the same arguments that we make with healthcare systems. It's about detecting subtle deterioration before it leads to something cat catastrophic. So this is some of the work that um, I did when I was a graduate student with my then supervisor, Professor Sa Tarasenko. Um, we were looking at creating monitoring systems for these patients, which are now on the engines, and these patients up here. You probably haven't flown on one of those, even if you've flown on an Airbus. That's the typhoon. But the, the name of the game with these systems, just like in healthcare, is to have a robust inference system, something that can consume loads of data and produce useful diagnoses for experts to look at. And of course, if these things are producing false alarms all the time, then they get turned off. So our predecessors, when looking at the data from Rolls-Royce, the conventional traditional approach, Rolls-Royce has a very high-tech control room. It looks a little bit like NASA, um, loads of screens. They're, they're parsing a whole fleet's worth of data at a time. Um, but the false alarms are just so high that they had to turn off all their automated systems. <clears throat> so the, 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 the techniques that we developed have a very, very low false alarm rate. Because the false alarm rate, you can imagine, um, if you are flying an aircraft and you see a red light, you've got a duty of care to land the engine. You have to land the engine, you've got a legal duty, to, you have to land the plane, you've got a legal duty to do so. So it's expensive to have, have false positive alarms in this environment. Likewise, in the healthcare environment, if you start having systems which are constantly saying the patient is sick or deteriorating, then unsurprisingly, those systems are not used. One of my favorite quotes on this subject was when we were talking to some of our clinical collaborators and they pointed out that junior doctors are trained to ignore the alarms for medical systems. And I don't know if you've ever visited somebody in a hospital and you've seen one of these devices going off, but it can be a bit disconcerting for a visitor, let alone for the poor patient who's connected to a device that looks like it's alarming and 
as, as if it's suggesting that something terrible has happened to the patient. And junior doctors are trained to ignore it and nursing staff. Which is the background against which all this work started. So an example of the kind of thing um, at the start of the story, doing this in hospitals, really building the scientific case before we move out into the wild, was based on data that we collect in hospitals. So an example of that is this. We're, we're, I'm showing you um, patient data of all different kinds. We've got uh, the patient's heart rate. We've got measures of the patient's blood pressure, um, the, the speed at which the patient is breathing, the respiratory rate, and how much oxygen they've got in their blood. And these are the kind of data that nurses look at usually once every four hours in a hospital. So you can imagine what happens between every four hours. And the machines that look at these data are simply saying whether or not the green line gets too high or too low, whether or not the yellow line gets too big or too small. And so that's the cause of all these false alarms. So one of the first systems that we created was, was used in hospitals to do data fusion, combining all of these data, as shown here, into one risk score, which is shown down below. And this patient had a very sticky end at 6 p.m. and was only identified by a nurse here, by which time it was far too late, about 20 minutes before. But you can see on this plot here, going back two hours approximately, there's the risk indices for this patient are extremely high already. And the, the key point is that these risk indices are high, but while the system's got a really low false alarm rate. So what we found is that nurses in this environment, because we gave this system a slightly different sound to normal monitors, start listening for this sound because it carries information. So it's really interesting to see that. When you release a system into the wild, the nurses start to react to the manner in which this system is communicating with them. And the nurses start to communicate with each other about this risk index as if it were another vital sign. So when a patient comes in, they would start talking about the, the, the patient's status index, which is this thing, and it goes up when the patient is getting sicker and goes down when the patient is looking more normal. So that's an, that's an example of a, a system that, that had a lot of engineering about it, but it was designed in collaboration and is now sitting in the NHS and being used. So as an example, here it is in the emergency department. This is uh, the, the emergency department in the John Radcliffe Hospital, where it's got some, some normal patient monitors, which you can see above the, the pillow on the bed there. So it's a very rare moment when the uh, resuscitation room has no patients in it. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. I must have got there really early in the morning. And this is our system next to it. So it's not a mobile system. It's plugged into the bedside. But it did allow us to develop a lot of the technologies that we're now porting through into the mobile and refining and maturing uh, for the mobile health uh, application. So an example of how this system worked um, was that we've ju we just completed, actually, a, a trial of this for, as you can see, 10,000 patients um, in the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Trust. And it was demonstrated that nurses don't start to get more time to spend with patients, but they spend this, they, 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 they are at max all the time. Nurses are consistently working uh, with their foot to the floor, so to speak, but they spend the time they have got when they've got an intelligent uh, analysis system like this, telling them the relative sickness of their patients, they spend the time they have got on the at-risk patients, which is, a, which is a nice outcome. I think if I was the medical director of a hospital and I had some nursing resource, I would like that nursing resource to be focused on the patients who are most at risk, which is what we found with this study. So I should say a philo philosophical point here, we're in the machine learning business. We're not trying to replace humans. We accept that clinicians have the best judgment of all pattern recognition systems um, and the a better ability to interpret and use more data than we have available here. But humans cannot parse terabytes of data, and that's where we can help. We can screen data. We can look at data second by second and produce estimates of risk and help those few rare clinical experts to focus their attention in the right places. That was exactly what we did with jet engines as well. We focused the vibration specialist attention on the two engines that really needed it out of the fleet of 10,000 engines that they had at any one day. So you can really use, <clears throat> take advantage of the technology to help you get the best out of your humanity, which is, which is, this is the argument I like, which is, uh, which keeps clinicians happy, I think. Um, so just some statistics for uh, some partners who did this in the US. 
and they took our systems, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, it's one of the US's largest research hospitals. And um, some of the stats for the clinical trials are shown here, um, demonstrating that the system, unsurprisingly, if you start, if you start focusing your attention on at-risk patients, then patient outcomes improve. I mean, that's not rocket science, but it's, a, it's, it's that first step where we've taken, this is the world's first and only, to my knowledge, FDA-approved patient monitoring device based on machine learning, where um, it's, it's improving patient outcomes in this way. Okay, so now we're getting on to the science. And I promise you, I promise you no equations, I, th I think. I might, I, might have, I might break that promise. Uh, but my goal, given that there wasn't a huge number of hands went up when we, when we saw it, when I asked the, the original question, I think we've got quite a mixed audience, um, which is great. That means we can talk about the big picture. Because very often, very often we lose the big picture because we get excited about equations. Uh, my discipline is very mathematical. We're, we're, we're doing applied statistics, I, I would say. And um, it's very easy to get caught up in the, the, the fun and the elegance of a, of a beautiful probabilistic model, but it's important to keep the big picture in mind. So <clears throat> what I'll do is give you a bird's eye view about the kind of, the flavor of the analyses that we're doing, because really that's what we're focusing on. We don't make hardware, we don't make build boxes, we construct probabilistic models, we do machine learning on data, we take data, we make models, and we put those models into hardware that somebody else has made, which makes us popular with people who make hardware, because they like having this stuff in it. So what I'm showing you here is a time series from a sensor. And coincidentally enough, this is pretty much the data you would get out of the back of an Apple iWatch, actually. Um, this is the amount of oxygen you've got in your blood, and that's something you can measure with a very uh, cheap, skin-worn sensor of that kind. And what you're seeing with the blue line is the sensor data, the thick blue line. Um, and you're seeing a nurse coming along and taking independent observations with the circles. And so, of course, every tick on the x-axis looks like it's about six hours there. Uh, this is a study that my wife ran, actually, in the cancer hospital center. Um, and so you can see it covers, what, about four days there. And um, one of the important parts about these techniques is, as, as it says here, they've got to be robust. They've got to cope with failing sensors and noise and the way that people use sensors. And that's typically where most things fail. I pointed out false positive alarms earlier, and a lot of them come from these notions because the data are missing, they're noisy, and they're often contradictory, particularly when you're combining the data of all different kinds, like I showed you in that first slide with the big, the, the big data slide. Um, there's lots of different kinds of data. So you need to be able to treat these in a, in a robust way. Now, robust to a lot of engineers means um, using principled probabilistic techniques. And what I'm showing you in the background with the dashed line and the gray area is a probabilistic model which is um, trained on the data from the sensor. But when the data from the sensor don't exist or become noisy, then it can kick in and start providing estimates. And so you can see in periods of missing data, it's actually providing a pretty good estimate of um, what the patient's actual condition is, even though the patient's not connected to the sensor. And you can, you can improve that based on other data that you might be collecting at the same time. And it's that lack of being able to do this which really prevents mobile systems from being used. When you, when you talk to your relatives who've been treated in the healthcare system, they probably haven't been treated so far using mobile healthcare systems. And that's because there's not a lot of reliability or clinical belief that they work. So Oxfordshire, we were on the procurement board for, for, this, for this project actually. Oxfordshire wanted to buy loads of systems from an existing supplier. We rated all the suppliers. We, one particular company, whose name I shan't mention, came out tops. Many systems were bought. All those systems are still kept in cupboards. They're not used because they're not reliable, because they don't do this. You, they, 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 they acquire data, but they don't turn it into meaningful, actionable information, to use the irritating managerial jargon. So what kind of, what kind of techniques are in here? Well, I'll just introduce you to a few terms for those of you who are not in this area. And if you are in this area, then you can just nod along safely. See, so the kind of techniques that we work on are, have these two descriptors. They are Bayesian and they are non-parametric. And I will introduce to you why I think these are good things to be doing. Um, Bayesian methods 
do, as we saw on the previous slide, they're robust to artifact and noise. Bayesian methods allow you to cope with uncertainty in a mathematical way. So they're principled in the, in the sense that they're based on the axioms of probability. And one of the fantastic things about these is if you've got some very highly skilled experts who know a lot about this data set, then you can, in some sense, incorporate some of that expertise in the probabilistic model. You can inform your model with some of the expertise that exists out there, which is extremely hard to capture. So my field, artificial intelligence and machine learning, is littered with corpses of machines that have tried to uh, encode doing that in a, in a probabilistic way. So you can, you can construct a model, you can cope with sensor data failures, but you can do it in a way based on the understanding that the clinician is pro providing for you about how those data should be changing, how we expect those data be, to be changing. Okay, so that's one half of the story, Bayesian methods. And Bayesian methods have been around a long time. Uh, the Reverend Bayes has been dead for a good 120 years. Um, Bayesian non-parametric models are those which are really exciting uh, researchers at the moment. Because non-parametric methods are, and I'm going to use that disgusting phrase again, big data models, in the sense that they scale to extremely large data sets. Once you, once you start collecting extremely large data sets, you want your model to grow in complexity. You can't just fit a bell curve to data when that data set has grown enormously to terabytes of data and comprises all sorts of different information, some of it which may be genomic, some of it which may be sensor data. So you need an, a new kind of science to cope with that. You want to keep all your Bayesian uh, methodology because you, you recognize that probability is, is a good thing to have, but you would really like the model to be able to grow in complexity as the, model, as the data come in and get more complex. And that's what non-parametric methods do. They scale. They, in some sense, learn model structure from the data. Uh, and, and they're avoiding making huge assumptions about the data. So that's about as far as we're going to get into the science, I think, in, in, in terms of the statistics. So my day job is, is pretty much the statistics of this. But um, I'd like to give you the bird's eye view about how the statistics are translating into, into healthcare. So these are, these are the kind of techniques that we're working on. So what can you do with these? So this is a slide produced by Marco Pimentel, who's currently writing up his thesis. He's, he's doing very well. Um, this is data from um, a cancer hospital study. And now we're, now we're talking about mobile healthcare data. So th this is still within the, within the NHS, still behind the great firewall of the NHS, so to speak. Um, but now the patients are out of bed and they're mobile, and we're using mobile sensors. Uh, what we're using here is a fairly straightforward sensor. It's just a fink clip called a pulse oximeter sensor. But the data are very similar to that which you would get from an iWatch or a Samsung equivalent. Um, and it allows you to extract quite a lot of vital signs through time for the patient. So as you can see here, um, time is increasing along here. Heart rate is going this way, measuring beats per minute, and the respiratory rate is here. We collect loads more information about patients. But for the purposes of uh, visualization, I'm going to show you these two axes, because otherwise it gets hard to show you. And so what we did here was a study of 500 patients. They're mobile, they're walking around. The data are usually extremely unreliable to the point where nurses would never use the system. But if you put sort of the right models in there and do the right analysis, referring to the previous slides, you can start to tell a lot about the patients. You can start to cope with a lot of the noise and a lot of the artifact. And what we learned from this particular study was that sick patients, it's a little bit like the start of the Grapes of Wrath. Uh, every Every healthy patient is alike, but unhealthy patients are unhealthy in their own way. Uh, so healthy patients, these, these, these four clusters here are four clusters of shapes that normal patient data take. So if you, if you are going through this study and you're wearing the, the mobile uh, sensors and your, your time series data, your shape of your data looks like this, I would say, our models would say, this patient is going to make it, this patient is okay. It's a problem for this particular patient group because they've got a one in six chance of being readmitted to the emergency, to the intensive care unit, where there's a 50% chance of dying. So it's a very high risk population. And we would like to stop them dying. So we'd like to provide early warning of, of these patients' condition. And what we found was that when you, this is the, this is the Oxford Cancer Center here. And um, what we found was, if you take new patient data, so the black line, and you compare it to the model, so that's this blue windsock-looking thing there, um, 
you can, you can make an estimate of similarity. So we tend to do this in a, in a much more, with all the vital signs. I'm just showing you two vital signs here, remembering we, this is increasing with time. But if, you, if, your patient's, if your patient's data look like this, and this is a healthy model, then we might assume if you're really close to it, then you're looking healthy. And what we found, um, and I'll, I won't explain this plot for the purposes of time, but if you're in the sciences, you probably know this is a receiver operating characteristic curve. What we found is that um, these systems, perhaps unsurprisingly, if you take into account um, the time series data and you cope with it in a robust way, then you can make very accurate predictions about patients who are going to be sick and deteriorate before they do. So it's all about providing early warning to the medics. Um, and again, just reinforcing that point, coping, turning the, the sensor data, which we think anyone can acquire, into useful information. So to highlight another little project we've got going, um, this is led by Professor Tarasenko. Patients don't like wearing sensors, so let's, let's take the sensors off the patients. Um, this patient is laden with sensors. This is a patient who's very kindly consented to be in a study. Uh, a dialysis patient doesn't have a great life, has to come in for hemodialysis three times a week and have a four-hour uh, blood exchange. Not much fun. It's got a bunch of sensors on here collecting the gold standard data. But the real sensor we're testing here is this thing. It's just a camera. And the camera allows us to extract some of the vital signs. So without even touching the patient, we can start collecting a lot of the vital signs. So there's a few places around the world that's doing this. MIT is interested in this. Philips is interested in this, and so are we. And we've all got slightly different takes and, and motivations and clinical applications. Um, but what we're showing here, um, these, these three plots are heart rate, breathing rate, and oxygen saturation. We're showing that the estimates from the camera in the red dots very closely match what we'd like them to match, the gold standard shown in magenta. Um, and at the top, I'm showing you the parts of the, this, this gentleman's face that are giving us the heart rate uh, information, so obviously the skin, and it's the fluctuation in the cheeks that gives us the heart rate. And then what we're seeing here is what gives us the breathing rate. And can you see this structure here? What, what, what part of the image is that? What is, it, what is this red band that's giving, us the that's giving us the respiratory rate? It's the top of his pillow. So we're getting it from his bedclothes, because obviously when he breathes, it moves up and down. And this was a, 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 an NHS and Oxford University spin-out company formed uh, quite recently. The NHS doesn't have a huge amount of spin-out companies, um, and so this, this was seen as uh, very, very exciting in that, in that respect. So moving on, what are we doing? Well, there's plenty of studies running at the moment in Oxford within the NHS, um, some of whom involve uh, cardiologists who are based here at the Oxford Martin School, um, such as Kazem Rahimi who's the lead cardiologist on this, um, where patients are sent home. Elderly patients, typically, are sent home with some sensors which are really easy to use. They just communicate with a tablet. And the tablet itself is very, very simple. It's got five buttons and a, a very st uh, straightforward messaging system so that the nurse can keep in touch with the patient. Um, and here, uh, COPD, that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's a lung disorder, and heart failure. These are patients who are living with the consequences of uh, having an abnormality for their whole lives. So usually these patients would see their medic once a year. And having a system like this, allowing a day-by-day -day update and a nurse to see the data and have conversations via message or via telephone uh, or, or via the tablet, is, is a huge increase in what you can do um, to, to help patients. Because otherwise, you turn up on February the 1st to see your, see your medic, and all the medic knows about you is how you feel right now and the measurements you've got right now. Um, if he's got a year's worth of data, the, the improvement in the, in the care for that patient can, can, can be drastic. But of course, once one is collecting data from patients, you have the notion of an early warning system again. We can prompt the nurse to say, hey, we stratified all these patients by risk. You're currently responsible for 50 patients. Here are the five today we think you should contact because their data look abnormal. OK, so just to close up, um, I've given you an indication of, I've given you a flavor for some of the scientific techniques that we're using and the applications uh, in the NHS and growing into the home um, for those. But also, one of the things that we're very keen on uh, I'd say about, about a third of um, my research is in translating this into the developing world. And there the problems are similar but different. And 
the reason I'm interested is because what's under the bonnet is the same in both. So the, the principled inference systems are the same in both. So what we can do, if we do have an intelligent, uh, a semi-intelligent smartphone into which we can incorporate some of the kind of techniques that we've been, I've been introducing previously, we can start making the sensors extremely inexpensive. And these systems are um, created, a lot of these are student projects from the Oxford Centre for Affordable Healthcare Technology. Um, this is led by Professor Gary Clifford. And um, I'll just introduce one of these sensors to you. This thing here on the left-hand side, that's an egg cup with a hands-free kit in it, where the principle is, can you make a sensor for cardiac auscultation that an untrained, so to speak, healthcare worker, a non-specialist healthcare worker, could construct themselves for, from items found on a market for a very small amount of money. And the way you can cope with such a lo-fi sensor is that you've got some intelligence in the phone counteracting the noise and the artifact that's coming from that. And indeed, the phone can help the unskilled worker to locate the, the thing properly themselves. So um, this particular study um, is run by David Springer, um, who's a fantastic Rhodes Scholar, doing this in a large clinical trial with clinicians in his home, uh, South Africa. Uh, uh, perhaps because my wife and children are, are Chinese, I, I, uh, I have a, a, a certain um, connection to, to China, and I, it, it turns out that I do quite a bit of my research there. Um, we've, we, we have a program running um, between Professor Clifford, myself, and China Mobile for estimating uh, cardiac uh, difficulties using, again, a low-cost sensor network. And this involves a, a bunch of other people, including Dr. Julianne Oster um, at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. It's a really exciting project because China Mobile is one of China's and the world's largest um, telecoms networks. And as you can see here, they've got 600 million subscribers and they cover most of China, even the rural bits. So you can pretty much get a China mobile signal anywhere, including in Tibet, which is where we've done one study. Uh, in Tibet, there are sensitivities about Han Chinese people uh, and the healthcare workers there are, tend to be local Tibetans. And the training for the local Tibetans is not Beijing level, let's say. Um, and so if you can give lesser trained healthcare workers a device, a smart tablet, which is connected to sensors that, that can in some way provide advice or um, can some way aid in the diagnosis of certain conditions, um, then, then, that's, then that improves patient outcomes. And, and one of the studies there is with the George Institute for Global Health, uh, whose logo is shown down here, um, and they are uh, a partner and indeed uh, part funded by the Oxford Martin School as well. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization of these entities uh, at Oxford. Um, and the George is based in Beijing and grew out of um, Australia and is also based in India, where we do some other studies. I should thank um, uh, the Oxford Martin School particularly because um, there's a new uh, president at Peking University, one of um, Beijing's and China's premier universities, one of the, I would say one of their top two, I think that's indisputable. Um, and they've just created a new $800 million international hospital using their own money. They want it to be completely independent of the government. And it's fully digital. So there are about 20 hospitals in the US that have this particular certification. Um, so it's really a remarkable place. Uh, and one of the nice things about the Peking University Hospital is that it's actually for the populace. It's not for, it's not for VIPs. There are a few VIP rooms that I saw, admittedly. Uh, this is China, after all. But, the, but the, most of the hospital is, uh, is set up to care for Beijing residents. Um, and so the, the project that we're going to do there is taking the, the M Health studies that I showed you before um, for coping with heart failure and sending patients home um, with these systems. I don't know if you're aware of the, 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 the sensitivities and how healthcare works in China. Um, my wife's family are right in the middle of China, in a province called Henan. It's a very poor province, there's a lot of poverty. And even for, for that population, if you get sick, what you usually do is go and see the boss in Beijing. The culture is you've got to see the big medic, no matter where you're in China. So, for example, uh, my, my, uh, my wife's grandmother, Lao Lao, uh, went to Beijing when she had a certain condition because she had to go and see the boss. 
the, the, the chief medic in that area. And you can imagine what that does to a healthcare system if, every, if the healthcare is centralized in such a way. We sort of see that in Oxford on a small scale. The John Radcliffe Hospital complains about being swamped as being the primary referral center. Wouldn't it be great if we could spread care out into the community hospitals? But in China, it's many orders of magnitude worse. So the appeal there is that Peking University can provide customers, literally customers, with these uh, mobile health systems, which are intelligent. They're, they're taking these uh, intelligent algorithms. And you can then send Gran home back to Henan from Beijing, which is a 17-hour train drive, um, with, with, a, with a monitoring system so that she feels like she's being cared for by the big boss in Beijing. So culturally, it fits. Technologically, it's an advantage. And hopefully, patient outcomes will improve if it, if it matches what we're seeing in the NHS. Uh, a, a study funded by uh, my college, Balliol, uh, took place in, in Guatemala, just giving you a, a feel for some of the other work that's going on in this area. Um, this, is, this is not particularly glamorous, diarrhea. It's the second largest cause of death for children worldwide. It's a huge problem. And what we did here was set up some M health systems so that we could improve therapies for that. And the Balliol study was focused um, on very poor areas of Guatemala, shown here. Um, this is uh, Rachel Hall Clifford, um, who, with, along with Sana Fatima, um, were, was leading this work out in Guatemala, training up local ladies to use these very low-cost systems to improve education and um, outcomes with respect to something that really, you know, is something that you can address. If you had to spend a dollar uh, to see a maximal improvement on the return of your investment in terms of human outcomes, Addressing something unglamorous like this does change a lot of lives. And finally, uh, something completely different. Uh, my, my father's family are from Kenya, and um, I have a, uh, a certain affinity there as well. With there's a lot of poverty, of course, um, and there's a lot of people who don't have even have drinking water. Think like water infrastructure. Before you even talk about healthcare, patients, people in rural villages don't have a lot of access to, to good water. And it's a problem of modern economics. Mines are encouraged to, for mining precious metals and diamonds and so forth. And um, plantations are encouraged as well for growing sugarcane and other cash crops. The economy needs these. The people, people's employment needs these things. But they suck water out of the aquifers in a way that is not quantified or understood very well. So this is a real problem for the government of Kenya and, and other states in Africa. You want to encourage these things because they're economically beneficial, but there is a probable, I would say, downside to people's access to water and health. So half the problem here is being able to understand the scale of the problem. How can we do that? How can you monitor water across a nation? in a scalable way. We, well, we can use the same kind of technologies, mobile healthcare technologies. We can install smartphones in the handles of pumps. Village, every village has got a, a pump like this, a pretty low-tech thing. They break very easily. And when they break, they tend to stay broken for a month or two. But the thing in the handle can do predictive maintenance, can, can do predictive um, assessment of the, the pump's condition, just like it was a jet engine but it can do it in the handset and can broadcast the results back to a central station. What we've just shown this summer also is that that smartphone in the handle can also estimate the depth of the aquifer so you can tell how much water it's got left as well, which is fantastic because suddenly the water pump network turns into an intelligence gathering network about the water levels you've got. So you can really start answering those questions about what is that sugarcane plantation doing to my poor regions. This is, this is a very exciting project. Oxford was just, uh, has, has had a very large grant in this area, which I don't think I'm quite allowed to tell you about yet, um, but, but it's very substantial uh, and it's very, very exciting. So just to wrap up, last slide. Um, there, are, there are some other, other aspects before we get into, to, that surround mobile health, which are coming uh, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, the biggest application, um, the most exciting in that area that I've been looking at recently is to do with uh, infectious disease. This is a project which um, links genomic data that we acquire from patients. So we extract the bugs from the patient's blood 
or other substances, and then try and work out what's in the blood. Alternatives to this take up to two months of white coats uh, doing microbiology in a very expensive lab. If you can do this quickly and cheaply, just using a chip, an immunochip, for example, that, that class of device, it could affect a huge amount of people. One million people died last year of tuberculosis, and a third of the world's population have this. Tuberculosis is a very big problem. It's becoming resistant to our antibiotics, as you probably know, but we haven't discovered any new antibiotics. This is a quote, again, from the chief medical officer she gave here at Oxford. No new classes since the late 1980s, and our bugs are getting resistant to these. Last year, we saw the first totally resistant tuberculosis drug, uh, bug, which was in India. So this is a huge problem. So what can we do? We need to be able to determine what's in the blood. So have we identified something new? How quickly will it spread based on the data that we've got? And critically, can we discover any new biomarkers in those samples so that we can encode those markers on cheap chips and distribute them in the millions to clinics in the developing world? So this is, this is a hugely exciting project because it has the capacity to link to a lot of the other data that we've got. So Oxford is rich in bioinformaticians. I'm not a bioinformatician. We have literally scores of world-leading people who do genomic analysis in this university. But the particular skill that we bring to the table is the fusion of genomic data with the time series data that we're collecting from sensors. Because really, that's the critical part in this particular project in being able to determine what's in this, the severity of the bugs, because we're never going to collect enough samples to be able to do it for the genome alone, we think. Or, or if we can, then it was going to require very large scale data collection. Um, and so going forwards, um, future technologies will be not just based on intelligent inference based on a mobile smartphone, but they'll also be based on the genetic data that we have available as well. This is something that Oxford, and particularly our lab, is very keen on developing, the fusion of genomic risk with risk from sensors. And we've got a few projects in this area, and you end up with these very interesting, uh, this is a, a, a biomarker actually for Crohn's disease, determining uh, the risk between various loci on the human genome for risk of these particular immune diseases. But where, where again, we're fusing these genomic data with mobile data. So I hope I've given you a flavor for what, what the science that's bubbling under the bonnet here at Oxford, which is percolating into the healthcare system as we demonstrate the efficacy of these techniques. Uh, no man is an island, and my island is here. Uh, some fantastic researchers, some of whom are in the audience, um, and I, uh, my collaborators are shown here. Uh, highlighted in yellow are those collaborators who are actually clinicians, full-time medics, um, sometimes academic medics, working in the Oxford um, uh, NHS Trust as well as Oxford University. And uh, thanks, of course, to the supporters who make this all possible. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be delighted to take any questions you have. Does anyone have any questions? Clara's got a microphone for you. Right, in the front. Uh, basically, I'm just worried about the security issues, like, you know, governments get a hold of this information. I mean, um, I think it's really impressive and interesting, and I think it's great, but, um, like, you know, like eugenics, things like that, um, governments making decisions on uh, who gets medicated, who gets treated, yep. who gets to live longer. So, yep. like, what kind of security issues would you put into this type of it's process? A huge, it's a huge concern, isn't it? Where that, where that meets the public, for example, with care.data, it hits the front pages. It, it's, it's one of the biggest deals in this kind of research. The UK is already, I would say, quite strict about these kind of things. And, that's, and if there are any medics in the audience, they're probably laughing their heads off right now. Because on a global scale, we're at the extremely conservative end of what we can do with medical data. So our colleagues at MIT say, 
share your data with us. We've shared our data with you, and we say we can't, because we have ethical protocols in place that prevent that, even completely anonymized data. So if you were concerned about privacy, the UK is a good place to be. Um, nothing is perfect, and no system is impregnable. I'm sure humans being humans, high-profile mistakes will be made. But I would say, as a researcher, looking at the state of the UK, um, it's taken extraordinarily seriously here. Uh, it, it affects my day-to-day -day life. It affects where my students can work. It, is, it, it, it affects what they can put on their computers. It affects how they access the data, where and when they can access the data, and how long we can keep it for. So I don't think there's a solution. I think we can take precautions, and the UK is very cautious. But it's a, it's a, it's a critical point, particularly when we start to talk about your genome. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. I was very pleased to see you have so many practitioners collaborating with you. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on how you see the role of clinicians, practitioners, in the sense that what do you engineers, developers, programmers need from clinicians when you want to develop all these things that most clinicians are very, very skeptical about? Indeed. OK, that's a, that's a great question. And I'd say that's one reason. I don't say, I'm not saying we've cracked it. But what, what progress we've made has, has really contributed to Oxford being one of the world's leading centers for biomedical research um, and, and biotechnology research. So to answer your question directly, the role of the medic is, is, a, is a project member now. So looking around the audience, there's, there's medics from our project sitting here. Um, and they contribute directly. They contribute their ideas. They give us the problems. They frame the medical problems. They're involved from the start when we write proposals. So we, we have an idea. We talk about it with our colleagues. They usually grow out of previous projects and conversations around the medical campus. And then we frame a grant proposal around that to make the project more formal. And the, they're often PI. They're often led by uh, a medic. And the medic attends all the meetings. Uh, there's lots of uh, clinical staff of varying grades associated with these projects. So I've just listed the team leaders here, but obviously none of these projects happen without a whole army of very talented uh, medical researchers. Um, and it's an iterative process. They pitch their idea, their problems, we pitch ideas, they come back and evaluate our ideas, we present our data to them the same way that we present them to each other. Yesterday I was in a meeting at the China Kaduri Biobank, project I haven't told you about because for, for brevity's sake, uh, with one of our fantastic, fantastic postdocs. Um, and we'd done some analysis as engineers on some data we didn't have a huge amount of familiarity with. And a lot of the meeting was, was, was instructional. It was about our clinical collaborators learning our language, because it's a new collaboration, identifying what it is that machine learning can do, the kind of questions that they can frame. And it was a, definitely a learning experience for us, learning about their particular data, uh, learning about the, the aspects of these very rich data sets that are being collected in the China Kaduri Biobank project. So it's, it's a definite sea change. And it's something you have to do if you want to do biomedical technology, I would say. In, in, the, in, the, in the traditional mode, engineers sit in dark rooms and make things. And then we try and push them on the world. And we say, this is great. This is a brilliant idea. It's going to revolutionize the world. Of course it's going to succeed. I love it. It's got to work. Uh, and a lot of Silicon Valley is, seems to be based on that idea. As long as you can convince somebody that your idea is exciting, then that seems, seems good. Uh, but you know, then clinical validation waves its. You know, the, the notion of clinical validation is, 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 is brought to bear. And that's what sinks most of these ideas. If you look at, if you open up the, I, the, the Apple iStore, how many clinically validated apps are in there, in the healthcare section? It's a number not unadjacent to zero. <laughs> um, and while we're by no means the only people doing it, the 
the apps and the stuff that we generate, usually for the Android open source operating system, is clinically validated based on very expensive trials involving lots of very well trained medics. Thank you. Congratulations, very impressive. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Just wanted to ask a practical question. You have given a number of examples of various sort of projects. Have you got anything in mental health? In mental health? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, my colleagues, one of, one of my colleagues in particular has a very strong area, interest in mental health. I've, I've deliberately not done that because I have to stop somewhere. Um, and yeah, I, I've quite a fi focused research plan. All, the, all, of, all of my fantastic team here are working on methods that are very much interrelated. Um, so there's, there's only so much that you can do. But, these kind of techniques do map onto mental health problems. Quantitative mental health is a very new discipline, as far as I can tell, from talking to professors of psychology here who are you know, very well-respected researchers in that area, and using data to affect the care of a field which is highly subjective is obviously ripe for being done correctly. And again, particularly in, in mental health, because because the outcome, the, because traditional diagnoses are extremely subjective, how how one approaches that with quantitative models is a is a very interesting question. I, I think there is a um, cross fertilization with um, my specialty. I work with eating disorders. I'm sorry. sorry. I work with eating disorders. Uh, so yep. so there's quite a lot of overlap. Uh, with your sort of physical observations. Yes. And, uh, so, would we well, uh, interested to discuss so, it? So with some some, some th that, that's a really interesting area. So, so the areas that we're, we've got studies running, not, not me personally, but, but my colleagues here in Oxford, um, include um, the AMOS study and True Colors, which are very high profile uh, projects in, in the NHS involving the Department of Computer Science, us in engineering, and uh, mental health. And there, patients are being, data is being collected from bipolar patients and trying to, trying to understand those, that particular uh, problem. But certainly, the use of data to inform in a quantitative way eating disorders, and even subjectively, I've got one of these little data trackers on, I find when I present myself with the data, I control my own living. You know, I sleep better and I eat better when I see the data. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a particularly perverse individual. I happen to like data, so that kind of thing works on me. Uh, it might not be a, a global solution, but that, that indicates, you know, if you close the loop and you show people the consequences of their actions, I don't know, I'm not a mental health expert, but there are, I suspect there are advantages to that approach. Um, just to put the shoe on the other foot, you've been asked a question about uh, how safe is the data mm -hmm. that you receive. Um, it might be interesting to ask the question, you mentioned, for instance, M I MIT is very able to use data quite re relatively freely. And obviously, yes. if you look at the example of Rolls-Royce and the jet engine, there's no real limitations on the data you receive. To what extent do you feel that the limitations placed around the use of data you receive stop you achieving things as fast as you might? And what suggestions might you have that would both protect individuality and patient safety and at the same time accelerate some of the conclusions you might come to? That is a very interesting question. How can we make the situation better? So before I answer that question, I will point out that, it's, that that is exercising the great and the good in this university and in the NHS. There's a study not study, a meeting at Trinity College. Our, I'm from Balliol, so those are our mortal enemies, our next door neighbors <laughs> um, at Trinity. And um, there, the question is, is, is ethical approval of the kind that exists in the UK strangling medical innovation? It affects us, and it makes things very expensive for the government. Uh, it focuses medical research on places that can afford it and places where the infrastructure 
is conducive for it. So one of the reasons that Oxford is a UK leader in this field is because we have these links to the hospital that, that allow us to do it right. I don't know if that's an argument for lower, lowering the, 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 the protocols. Um, how much would be accelerated? I think our colleagues' work elsewhere could be dramatically accelerated if we could share our data with them. I mean, we have extraordinarily large amounts of data, but only we are allowed to look at it. And even we, when I say we, subsets of us are allowed to look at subsets of our own data. So if I want to move a student from one project to another, I have to go and get ethical approval. Um, so you can see inhibition of, you know, that's slowing things down. There's a bit of friction. Is it there for the right reasons? I, I, I'm, I'm more sanguine. Uh, I, 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 I quite believe in, uh, in, in quite stringent medical uh, ethical approval, but you know, I'm, some things can be done. We still get research done. Then I'm sure that there's a happy medium to be reached. Certainly, to take one example in my field, there, MIT has created a very large, rich PhysioNet resource which is a lot of data. And a lot of theses I'm asked to examine, download PhysioNet, create some new algorithms, tonk around with it a bit, and get a thesis, for example. You know, there's a lot of medical research that does that. UK, European, US, Chinese, Indian. It, medical research institutions are doing that. They've created this big database, and it's enabling tons of research to happen. So yes, could we be an enabler? We might be able, we, we, could, we could change things so that so we could be an, an enabler, but, uh, but we're still getting work done. So I think, I think the future lies somewhere between the extreme of having no controls and what we've got at the moment. But thank you for the question. Hi, uh, you talked about um, patients not liking the sensors on their, on their fingers. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering um, how often our good ideas come through from patients themselves. Um, do, you, do you have ways of maybe gathering that, or does it tend to come through the, through the medics and other avenues? So it tends to... That's a great question. In this brave new world of patient engagement, uh, we do have patients, we, we, we try to make sure that we're involving patients at every step of the way. Obviously, we, they're not involved in our research meetings. Um, we do have very patient-focused members of the team. So usually research nurses who are doing, doing all the hard work about collecting data and making sure the patient's happy and consented in the medical approval process. Um, and it's usually those patient-facing nurses that report the patient's concerns or ideas. Sometimes those do happen. So certainly, we were sitting around a table. We devised a study. It was a study of people who'd ab had upper gastrointestinal surgery, so they had scars. And then we gave them ECG sensors to wear, which go on the chest. And Kel surprise, they didn't like that because it was banging against the scar tissue that they had on their chests. Um, and, and so patients were saying, you know, obviously, this is, this is barking mad. Uh, it, it, it may be saving my life, but it's extremely uncomfortable. Um, and, and, and alternatives were found uh, that were suitable for the patient. So, so even when we get it wrong through our naivety, the patient's there to correct us. Because ultimately, it's. If, if, if they're not happy in the UK system, if they're not happy, then they don't consent. So our systems are designed with them in mind. This, this, this notion of the patient being at the center of the operation is definitely the case, because it's a sine qua non. If, if the patient doesn't like what we're doing, we don't do research, because we can't have their data. I guess I have the microphone. Um, I'm wondering, to what, in terms of Oxford's involvement in mobile health in low-income countries, yeah. um, what is its involvement in the various stages of mobile health being effective to completion? So the research and design that takes place at Oxford, and then the implementation and rollout in the field, and then the monitor and evaluation that takes place afterwards. And is Oxford only involved in that first step, or what is its relative involvement okay, in the whole that's, picture? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, 
we, 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 we have a lot of the scientific expertise here to construct the models. You can't really export that because that, the construction of the, the scientific methods has to be near the data from which the models have been created. Um, so certainly the, that part is, is done at Oxford. Um, there are some studies where Oxford systems are given to people and they do studies. So the UPMC is not the developing world by any case, it's in Pittsburgh. <laughs> but but you know, that's a case where technology was handed over and they ran an independent study. Um, and there are studies like that. So we've done um, Arvind Raghu, who's a, a doctoral student with us, is doing a study of 65,000 villages around South uh, India. And there, the systems, the, the, the mobile health systems are being used by obviously local clinicians, village experts who are going from village to village, um, ASHAs they're called, ASHAs. Um, and Oxford is only involved in the coordinating there. But then we have other studies such as the one that I mentioned um, at Peking University, where Oxford is designed in more closely, um, building on the NHS-based expertise that we've been given. So it's a bit of a sliding scale. Uh, and it, to be frank, it often depends on the funding available. Because you know, Oxford expertise is, you know, we have to pay people's salaries. And so to do that, uh, the, the salaries are paid where the funding exists. And you know, NHS funding is substantial, so is Wellcome Trust funding, etc. Developing world funding, we find it a lot harder to secure equivalently large grants. The Gates Foundation has been fantastic. There are other equivalents. Um, my college has been very supportive. The Oxford Martin School funds research in this area. But the scale is different. So we do what we can, um, but, it, but it does vary according to those factors. Thank you, a very interesting talk. Just a question about the surveillance of hospitalized patients. Yeah. Have you already demonstrated that there is uh, a difference of outcomes between patients uh, with uh, your devices and with standard care? Because what I, in other words, maybe you can just displace the, the bottleneck, you know? You have a lot of warnings. Yep. But what to do with absolutely. these warnings? You're absolutely right. So even with the best technology in the world, is anybody paying any attention? So that's usually, in these studies, that's usually called the efferent arm. So we can affect, we can affect the, 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 the quantitative analysis and the alerting, uh, and we can do that in a maximally robust way, and everybody's very happy on the technology side. But if the efferent arm isn't there, if patients, if patients aren't being treated because nurses are too busy or because they're ignoring it, that, that's a failure of translation. So the, that, that's the big question. What, so what? What difference does technology make? Mm -hmm. And that's what all our studies are set up to frame that, that question precisely. So these are usually, we would like to do an RCT in these kind of studies. It's pretty hard to do it with big infrastructure projects, a randomized controlled trial. Giving someone placebo or technology or is, a, is, a, is fairly difficult here. So we have a lot of before and after trials where it's existing standard of care followed by some training and then deposit and use of the systems. And those demonstrate efficacy. So those demonstrate improvements in patient outcome. Those demonstrate, demonstrate that nurse attention is being focused on sick patients, et cetera, et cetera. So when we develop technology, we set up a clinical trial to evaluate it. So the clinical validation is the, is the important part. And really that's when the Wellcome Trust fund a project for three years, it requires that. It, it, there are bo bo box of in, a number of interesting boxes you have to tick. So clinical validation is, is a huge one. Other ones include, um, how is this going to be commercially exploited? What is, say in some sense, what is the business model? And you're being asked that for a medical research project, which is, which is interesting. And maybe that's because engineers are involved. Maybe it's the current economic climate, but I, I suspect actually what it is, is that if you are the Wellcome Trust and, or the NIHR, the National Health Services Research Branch funding, then if you're going to deposit some money with an institution, you don't want that money to result in an activity that evaporates at the end of the project. So sustaining the research after the project is really what that's all about. And clinical validation is one part of that. So if you don't get clinical validation, it's going to evaporate probably. 
And if you don't turn it into something, if you don't deliver a system, uh, a, a box or a technique uh, or a risk score, then likewise, where's the sustainability? Is this just, gonna, just going to evaporate if we give you three million pounds? You know, is it, are we just gonna close the books and then do, an, do a new project? So, you, so just on that latter point, if I may elaborate, which wasn't part of your question, um, a lot of these projects have a commercial partner involved. Sometimes it's a big boy like Microsoft. So with the infectious disease stuff I told you about there, Microsoft is very kindly uh, giving us access to a lot of resource in cloud computing, that dreadful phrase which I promise not to mention. Um, sometimes it's a university spin-out company. So the university is really uh, keen on the Stanford model, spinning out uh, activity based on a bundle of patents that have arisen from work that you've done in the university. So then that, that entity embodies those patents and can take on the, the role of being the exploiter in, in the nice sense of the word exploitation, in the sense that it's developing the technology and doing things that a university doesn't want to do. When I first turned up at Oxford, um, Professor Tarasenko's group, which I joined, uh, was doing a lot of that. They were making systems for Rolls-Royce. Hardware was being constructed and given to Rolls-Royce. And it was, it, was pretty, it was a stretch. Um, it, was, it was important in getting the job done. It was what a pragmatic engineer would do to make the relationship work and to get the science done. Um, but ultimately, those, are take, those roles are taken over by spin-out companies because they're great at making things, validating things, and so on. So clinical validation and commercial validation, in that sense, are both key parts of doing medical research in, in this technology area. Um, if you had, uh, say, a patient and they had, you know, say, some vital signs or some value that your model predicted as being or normal, or you know, they fell within the normal range, yeah. but because of their individual circumstances, that was very abnormal from them, or vice versa. Yeah. Say they were, they felt fine, but their, uh, you know, their vital signs were really bad. Yep. How, how does your model sort of adjust for treating an individual rather than just like a population considering that it's a big data set? I like that question. You should come and work in our group. That's, so there's another horrible buzzword, which is patient-centered medicine or patient-specific care, uh, which is, again, something we used to write to grant proposals a few years ago, which, but, but actually it has a tangible statistical meaning. It's where the patient becomes their own model. So, so these techniques can learn some of the techniques which I've shown you can learn online. So as you acquire data from a particular patient, then the model can be updated in real time. And the model can be improved to be specific to that particular patient. Um, if we don't have any information about a patient at all, if we just got their demographic details, then maybe we compare them to human males age 60 to 70. Um, but as we start collecting more data, we can construct posterior models of the patient's data, so it becomes more specific to their own individual physiology. Um, this is something, this, this, and, we're, and we're, we're always widening our scope in doing this. So we started off with saying, okay, well, maybe we can use individual patients' data from a hospital stay. Maybe we can extend it and look before and after where they were on the ward. Maybe we can now go back to the, to the family doctors, to the GP data, outside of hospitals, maybe we're getting all their previous referral data. One of those lines, graphs I showed you had 20 years of data. So we can take into account a patient's life history now um, when we're informing our models to make them targeted to Mr. Smith rather than human male age 60 to 70. And the genome is just another generalization of that argument. That's why it fits so nicely. Looking at, first of all, particular subsets of the genome which might be relevant for this particular patient. So particular aspects of the genome which have been associated previously with cardiovascular risk, it's nice to know if those are there or not for a patient if they are coming in for cardiology. So we have some tangible projects now where genomic data from a patient and their 20-year time series is being used to inform their care. That's, that's a really exciting generalization of just how specific can we make it. Not only your data, not only your lifetimes, hospital data and lab data, but your genome too. Well, 
Well, if that's all the questions, and I have to say they have been brilliant and very, very interesting, I think all that remains is to thank David very much for a fascinating seminar. Thank you. Thank you.